welcome to Behind the Ticker. I'm Brad Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Thor Financial Technologies and Portfolio Manager of THLV, the Thor Low Volatility ETF. Behind the Ticker uncovers the inner workings of the ETF industry. We will interview portfolio managers and ETF service providers to dive deep into their work lives and their businesses. We will learn the inner workings of their strategies and what drives them as they continue to grow their company. Many of these individuals are entrepreneurs and will have unique and compelling insights to share as much goes on behind the ticker. Please note, nothing in this show is investment advice, and it is meant solely for educational and entertainment purposes only. Welcome to Behind the Ticker. Today we have Mike Venuto from Title. He's also the portfolio manager of Block, B-L-O-K. I could have talked to Mike literally for hours. Wealth of knowledge. If you want insight on how to get an ETF started, if you want insight on how to get an ETF to work uh, and be successful, Mike provides us a ton of knowledge. We also talk a little bit about the Block ETF, uh, the first blockchain ETF released. And I think you're going to find this episode really, really compelling and fun. So without further ado, Mike Venuto. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting us. Excited to uh, talk with you today. Sure. So I was reading up or trying to follow your bio. You're a busy man. <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about your background and, and how you got into the position that you are today? Yeah, um, I'd like to say it, it all happened very quickly and lucky and all that sort of stuff, but that's so far from the truth. It's been an enormous amount of work. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the basic background is I grew up in North Carolina. I studied philosophy and religion. I came to New York primarily because um, my grandmother had passed and my grandfather was settling his estate and I'd been here every summer and loved fishing and all that fun stuff. Um, took a internship on the New York Stock Exchange, who is, I believe, one of our sponsors for this, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's always strange when I'm there and we're talking ETFs and I, I remember I worked there before most of those people who help us yeah. now. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so the internship, I thought I was going to use that to like write an expose on how greedy Wall Street is and all of that horrible stuff that people like to throw out there. Instead, I fell in love with it. It was very much a meritocracy. Um, from there, I bounced around. I took my first job as a stockbroker. Um, at at the time, it was called Wheat First Union, which became Wachovia, became a bunch of different things. I think it's owned by Wells Fargo now. I like to say that for that year and a half, I learned everything not to do. I learned how <laughs> not to be a fiduciary. I learned... <laughs> I learned how to accept rejection, um, all that fun stuff, because even though they were a big firm, it still was like a um, a bucket shop, as they like to call it, a Wolf of Wall Street kind of thing. Uh, from there, I jumped to Horizon Kinetics. I was like the third or fourth person there, worked my way up through the ranks there. Um, that's where I fell in love with ETFs, because okay. uh, you know we were known as a company that would buy... 15 to 20 concentrated positions, unique stocks, and ETFs are the killer app against that. Um, and I got to give credit to the to the management team there. They recognized that, and rather than run from it, they said, oh, hey, young Mike, you, you go figure out how we're going to hedge this. Um, and our hedges were great. We became like one of the largest shareholders of Wisdom Tree in a 2 and 20 hedge fund when nobody even knew Wisdom Tree was public and we financed Emerging Global Advisors, which is now Columbia Threadneedles ETF family. We partnered with Ice Ventures. We basically got behind all of these ETF startups back in 2008, 2010. Um, that culminated with me leaving in 2012 um, with with uh, them supporting me in that they were the original, the, the partners there uh, were the original financers of my current business. In 2012, I started this company, but I also needed a day job. I, I, I'm sure you're going through it as well, right? Like starting an ETF company is so hard. I don't know why everybody <laughs> thinks it's easy. Um, 
So my day job was I was head of investments and a partner at Global X for the, for about three years while I was kind of incubating Tidal. Um, today, Tidal is about six and a half billion in assets, and we've helped about 80 ETFs come to market, launch, and grow. Um, that certainly wasn't the original plan. The original plan was more of a SMA shop, but what turns out is all the research content material we needed to to um, launch SMAs was actually much better used to grow ETFs. <laughs> right. Right. That um, our first client was Global X, then Direction, then the uh, EMQQ. I was mentioning you before the show uh, up here to see a friend at, uh, at EMQQ. Um, so today, that's really what's become our core business um, is taking all that research, IP, all the mistakes that were made in the emerging global era, the wisdom tree era, the global X era, the direction era. We try and help our clients not repeat the mistakes that um, our team has made everywhere else, which is a huge leg up. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you this later, but I think it's it's better to ask it now. I mean, looking at your, hearing that and looking at your resume, I mean, you are uh, the true definition of, of an entrepreneur. So tell me about kind of some of the things you've had to learn al- along the way of kind of going out on your own and, and, and growing title from, you know, what was supposed to be an SMA business to what it is today. I mean, we all go through pivots. That's part of entrepreneurship. So yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. All right. So I think the number one thing that I can point to is knowing what you don't know or what you're not going to be good at. Now, there's a couple of things that come with that. I have an amazing partners that are equals to me in this business, right? Like, um, and I watch a lot of people try and do this as the solopreneur. It's, it's hard as hell with partners. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to recognize what you're not good at and find partners who are good at that and then have a set incentives aligned. Um, Number two, everything's going to be so much harder than you think it's going to be. And it's going to cost twice as much, maybe yeah. three times as much as you think yeah. it's going to cost. Um, and, and you can't get, you can't give up every time there's a giant, you know, roadblock. I right. mean, we've had so many fits and starts. And then, you know, I walk around a, a, an ETF conference or whatever, and it was like, oh, you guys are doing so great. Congratulations. Yeah, overnight success took eleven years. Right. Um, so <laughs> it's right. it's so much harder than people think, um, and that's a big part of what we try and do. Like, you know, um, uh, I listened to the show you did with Garrett, and Garrett, I have nothing but respect for him. We're we're competitors. We actually talked yesterday. We we refer to each other as frenemies. Like it's <laughs> it's funny how small the ETF business is. Um, you know, I launched a fund on his platform at one point and I had to close it. You're yeah. going to like, <laughs> so, so like it, it taught me a ton and I said, okay, this gave me an opportunity to learn something. And so having good partners, knowing it's really hard and learning from the mistakes. I mean, those are some of the things that most entrepreneurs can't get in their head and we still see it every day. I mean, we get pitched on average three new ETF ideas a day. Yeah. Um, and the things that people think are important are so much less important. And the things that really are important, they don't want to hear. Right. Like, right. The hard stuff. I, the hard stuff. I, I don't care that you got the next great idea. Um, good for you. How are you going to market it? Where's your seed capital? Who are your partners? What's your ticker? What's what's your story? Isn't that your behind the ticker, not what's your ticker? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's yeah. it's funny. I mean, my my father in law, I I went to be, uh, I started my kind of like entrepreneurship journey in 2013. And I remember him looking at me in the face, like a month after he's like, you know, you better be ready to crawl through glass if you're going to make this work. And and literally that's what it is. You're just every day, things are going to hurt. You're going to get dinged up. You got to just keep moving. And, you know, we've pivoted a couple of times. Uh, I mean, we started this business, our current business is uh, we were going to run private funds and I went to SMA re- research and now all of a sudden we're in the ETF business. So, I yep. mean, I didn't think we'd get there, but um, it's just the path that you take. So before we talk about title, cause I, I have a lot of questions about title. 
personally, I always like to ask, what do you like to do when you're not working? I, you know, you mentioned Garrett, he flies planes, which I, I think is really cool. Uh, I talked to Patricia Lizaraga, who runs the WCEO ETF and not a lady I thought would um, be a sailboat racer, but she is. <laughs> yeah. um, so what do you like to do for fun? Yeah. I mean, my uh, way of relaxing is being on water um, in a boat, on a kayak, uh, most of the time with my kids. Um, my latest project is uh, my neighbor and I, uh, my neighbor has kids that are the same age as mine. We just acquired for an extremely low amount of money in 1973 Mako, which is an old boat. Yeah. Um, and I have my kids painting it last weekend. I took them to the welder and had them learn how to weld it. So I love everything building up to restoring something beautiful and then putting it on the water and going fishing. I, I love to be out there on the water. Um, actually that's kind of where the title brand came okay. around. There right. Um, uh, the title brand, not only is it the navigating the chaos of water and all that, but it's also the polarity, the bull and the bear market, the ups and the downs, the rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. Um, all of those things are kind of connected to how we ended up with that branding. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, I, my, my partner, uh, has a boat and we actually went up there this weekend and it, it is, there's something about being on the water. That's peaceful. Even though my, my wife screamed at me cause I took our, uh, two year old on a jet ski and maybe was pushing <laughs> it a little bit, but you know, you live and you learn, but let's talk about title. Um, can you tell me exactly what title does and you know, what made you kind of, you, you alluded to how the company was supposed to start as SMA, mm -hmm. but how did it get to where it is today and the services it, it provides? Yeah. So, you know, when I left Horizon Kinetics, you know, at some point we had 40 billion there and it was mostly SMAs and I had all these fun friends that, you know, I, they would come to me saying, Hey, you know, can we get you on the platform? Cause it was the hot dot. So I'm thinking, all right, when I leave, I'm just going to call all these people up and say, put me on the platform. I now have new SMAs and yeah. Um, no, that didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> They also come back and when you have a three-year track record and 200 million or a hundred million, you know, we really respect you guys. Da, 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 da. I've never understood this. How are you supposed to get to two or 300 million if everybody tells you to come back? Um, so, you know, we started a little wealth management practice just to, to incubate our SMAs. Um, and it's funny, that's at this point, that's like 600 million of our AUM. <laughs> right right yeah but we're not even like we're actually spinning it out into a new entity to make it so it can go grow with a new leadership because we're solely focused on the etfs we're, we're spinning it out to joshua wilson and this entity called united ethos but it's funny the part that that um was the original it's it, it still wouldn't be sustainable for the entity we have today right um so what did we do the we took all that ip and research and we ended up using a lot of it to help Global X grow. It was a very successful partnership. And then when Guillermo and I left and Murray acquired um, Global X, uh, we said, all right, what other ETF issuers could this work for? So then we pulled in Robo Global, which I think is now owned by Vetify, and we pulled in EMQQ and then Direction as clients to use our IP, our content, our research for doing SMAs to help them sell ETFs. Holy shit, it worked. Um, <laughs> right Now, here was the negative. It worked great for them. For us, it just kept the lights on because we didn't own the products. Right. Right. We owned, um, you know, whatever hard dollars they paid us to use our research and content to help them get assets. Then they got assets and they got recurring fees. Right. We didn't get recurring fees. Right. <laughs> um, so that culminated with us saying, well, if we're the thought leaders in the ETF industry and we have all this IP and all that stuff, we came up with this amazing idea. We still run the index of it. It didn't work as an ETF, but we came up with the idea of let's do an ETF that tracks all the companies making money in the ETF industry. Okay. Right? So like, we all agree that the ETF industry is growing. This is obvious, right? So, so, you know, it was wisdom tree and BlackRock and, um, 
uh, State Street and um, the index provider, MSCI, S&P, the New York Stock Exchange, it still exists. It's on our ETF Think Tank website as an index. We launched it with ETC with Garrett and Jay. I have nothing negative to say about the experience. It was awesome. We did everything right, except we never got assets. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that brought us to the next idea, which was uh, Eric Falkeis, who was running Directions Business and was a client, said, hey, guys, you just raised $100 for us, and you're not getting BIPs. Like, what if I come over there and help you guys build a white label business, and not only do we help people launch but we helped them grow right and so that was kind of the nexus of what became modern day title today um (laughs) right so we went from helping others grow etfs to helping others launch maintain and grow etfs um and now it's been a beautiful partnership uh with you know 80 funds out there (laughs) So, and I was looking on the website, I was, I was trying to understand all the services. We'll get to the, you know, starting from scratch, launching a fund and and getting all and and getting them to grow. Um, We'll talk about that a little bit later, but you have kind of like four subgroups of clients. You have advisory clients, sub-advisory, research, and consulting. So can you define kind of what you do in each one of those four silos? Yeah. So the first one is what I would call the traditionally what's thought of as white label, right? It's in our trust. We're soup to nuts doing, you know, 90% of everything. Um, You know, it's, we have this great slide where it shows how complicated the industry is. And then we show a picture of the client and the investor and we connect them and put it all to bed. So those are clients like SoFi. Um, You know, we have ADTFs with them. Sharia funds, which is our indie hit. It's a group in Canada that's, Got you know three ETFs and over five hundred million across them. Nobody's ever heard of them. Uh, Eris or Evoke is now their new name. That's our par. Um, some new ones that have been surprising to people, like the Meet Kevin, the PP, yeah. um, or Y'all. Um, we have some amazing ESG funds. You know, with social justice. Um, you know, all those things. Those are kind of our core clients. Um, Bob Elliott with HFND, Michael Gayad with the ATAC funds. So these are people that we're doing all the back office stuff and then we're providing sales and marketing support. Um, And something that does make us different than others is we have this eighth service. You know, we have eight buckets. (laughs) The eighth service is we'll also step in and take economics, meaning we'll partner with our clients. So it's a pretty simple math, right? Uh, if an ETF costs X to run, we'll come in and say we'll cover X percent, twenty percent. That means when the ETF becomes profitable, we also like to get twenty percent of the profits. Yep. Yeah. So those can be extremely painful deals because you're on the other side with the client, and then when they work, they can be spectacular. Right. Um, and we do that for about a third of our clients. Um, so that's the core business. That's about out of our six and a half billion. That's about four point two ish. Then we have the next bucket, which is sub advisory, and that's where we're doing the actual trading execution and basket management for bonds okay. trust, some Ultimus trust stuff for Amplifies trust. Um, you know, a number of different places. ETC does this too. Um, yeah. You know, so they got Andrew over there and they do it. And then the third bucket is where we're offering limited. I say limited because we don't offer all of our sales and marketing tools to people who are not in our trust, but we offer um, various accesses to our network. So the ETF think tank is our research and marketing brand or media brand. Cynthia is our head of research there from uh, Cynthia Murphy. And essentially, over the last 11 years, we've curated an audience of people who like to learn about ETFs, yep. right? And so we help those people with education. We sponsor things like research for them or getting a certificate. Uh, uh, the thing with Edelman we sponsor. We sponsor some of Darius Dale's research. Or we help them with growth hacks like their social media. So 
we allow companies like State Street and Wisdom Tree and Columbia Threadneedle and EMQQ that these companies are not in our trust, but they can access that network by subscribing to the ETF Think Tank research. And then finally, the consulting are usually clients that are probably going to launch an ETF or a product someday. But right now, they're more like an RIA and we're helping them understand their ETF strategy. Um, And eventually, once they get past, you know, doing it as a wealth management, they're going to want to launch a product someday. (laughs) So those are the four buckets. So in your advisory business where you're doing kind of everything, are you, are you doing everything as far as do you, are you doing admin internally? Are you doing trading? Are you helping them with legal? Obviously you're helping them with marketing. I mean, are you do when someone clicks that button that's on the top right of your website that says build an ETF, yeah. right? And they become the core, a core client. Do you guys do everything or is there some outsourcing that goes on? So I would say we 100% oversee everything. The client wouldn't even know if something was being outsourced and very little is outsourced at this point. Now, we do also make it quite a la carte. Not every client chooses every service, right? Like I was right. saying like 30% choose to have us invest alongside of them. I would say 70% choose marketing, 50% choose sales. It all starts for us with our first bucket, which is what we call a strategic assessment. Um, and this is where we sit down with the person. We've probably had two or three conversations by now. And we say, all right, it's time for the assessment. And think of the assessment like like taking a personality exam or something like that, right? So we have 114 questions that we've scored against 70, 80 other ETF issuers that we've talked to or been pitched. I say 70, 80. Now I'm thinking about it. It's probably way more than that now. I think that's an old number. Yeah. Um, because we do two or three of these a week, right? So when we go through, it's it's pretty straightforward. We ask you these questions and we say, okay, we're going to click off a number from you know one to a hundred for each of those questions compared to everyone else we've asked them to. We come back uh, two, three days later with a seven page report that says, here's where you score on strategy versus everyone else that's pitched us. Here's where you score on product. Here's where you score on sales. And here's where you score on marketing. Here's your overall score. Here's your pro forma of what this is going to cost. And here's our suggestions. This is what we think you should think about for the price. This is what we think you should think about for the, the this. This is how much seed we would recommend. And then, you know, this is hard, but occasionally we tell people no. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so this process is not only about them getting to know us and us it's also about us getting to know them and you know really deciding if we're going to get somewhere because i don't want an etf on my platform that doesn't succeed right i always tell my clients i don't want to write you checks right, right? when when it's not succeeding you're writing me checks i right. i want you to be receiving checks from me right. not not right. not the other way around and so the strategic assessment I, I know it sounds simple and I, I always feel like I, I try to oversell how awesome it is, but <laughs> like, like preventing mistakes is way, way more important than what you do next. Like, like you can't, if you get the product wrong or you get the launch date wrong or the ticker wrong, like, like, I mean, I see it all the time. I was talking with somebody yesterday, they have a ticker it sounds cool and it's a funny word, but no advisor is ever going to want to see that on their statement. Yeah. Uh, like like yeah. They, they get lost in things that we can help them prevent. Um, right. So once we go through the assessment, it's really nice because then they've got everything in front of them. They sign an LOI where, you know, 90 days to launch from there, right? 75 days with the SEC, 15 days. in, like you said, we have legal in house. Um, I heard Garrett say 90K a couple of times. We charge 70. So just uh, I told him I was going to tease him about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and then, uh, yeah, we, we've got the admin. We've got the trust compliance. We have the boards. We have two trusts live today. And it'll be announced soon that we're getting a third one. Um, yeah. And then once you're here, we have all the in-house portfolio management 
we also think of active management as a service beyond like, so we've had clients come to us and say, you know, I want this portfolio to be managed actively. So I've got three or four active PMs on the staff, right? So, you know, that's, we, I know we're going to talk about block later. That's what we do at block, but we also have uh, a number of them that we manage actively for Amplify because they wanted active managers in there. Um, and then we have our, our marketing efforts, our sales efforts, and we make those coordinated. We call it smart growth program, right? It's amazing to me how many, people new to this business think that sales and marketing are separate things. Yeah. And if they're not coordinated, they're garbage. And then yeah. like, like, so it's like, Oh, but I just want a sales guy running around. Yeah. Well, what material is he using? What story is he using? What is he connecting to? What content is he following up with? Like a wholesaler with, with a fact sheet is useless. Right. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask it. I was going to ask this and it's a perfect time to ask it. So like, it seems to me, and I've been talking to, you know, I talk to a lot of advisors who think that, you know, maybe they want to run an ETF one day. And there's this mentality, like, if I build it, they will come. And yeah, field of dreams. The field money dreams. is just going to be there. That's just, that's just not the case, is it? No. I mean, it almost never was, but it felt that way many years ago. So like in the heyday at Global X, we would launch something and it would be immediately approved at Morgan Stanley. Well, that makes things a lot easier, right? right. Like, yes. <laughs> you know? like, like, oh, Mike, you have this guru idea. Let's launch that and see what happens. And then the next day, a Morgan Stanley advisor puts $40 million into it. Right. Okay. That's never going to happen again, right? Because right. like, um, it can't. They've put up the gates, right? So it's like, yeah, if you build it, they will come and they'll be circling around and sniffing, but they're not coming in because there's a giant gate around the ballpark. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so – Look, we just had a nice hit with uh, Roundhill. We did chat. Um, yep. You know, you still can get a viral concept out there at the right time product, at, you know, right product, right time. But everybody thinks, oh, well, that was easy. Now, Roundhill has done an enormous amount of work on marketing yep. it, getting in the right spots, getting on the right things. Like even something that looks like an indie hit that was just like easy – it wasn't easy, no. right? No, they did an enormous amount of work. We did an enormous amount of work. Um, you just, people don't see that. Um, yeah. So I, I mentioned Global X earlier, and I love this whole, uh, if they build it, it will come concept. I remember at the end of Global X, Bruno, who was one of the co-founders, Bruno DeLama, um, him and I were taking a walk through Manhattan and we were talking about the deal and getting out. And he says to me, Mike, I never want another person to pitch me their ETF idea. And I was like, why? He's like, well, you know, at Global X, it's not about the idea. It's about the, you know, multi-million dollar marketing budget, the brand, the website that people go to already, the the content that they kick out. It's the the budgets for all these things that an idea that somebody pitches you versus an idea that that Global X launches – it's not the idea that makes it successful at Global X, right? Yeah. It's the right. same at First Trust. It's the same at Pacer, right? So, like, um, that's why they don't mind being second or third to market on things, right? Um, yeah, they have so, the budget and the uh, and the marketing know how to to keep dripping. And what do you? So, what do you think? Um, some of the mistakes and pitfalls, like an early someone who's going to issue or an early issuer makes. And I think there's a, there's probably a lot of these mistakes out there because there's a lot of ETFs that just never get it going. Um, and what do you yeah. think some of those mistakes are? I mean, so the number one thing is the P of product, right? So sometimes people come up with a product that they think solves a problem, but the market doesn't. Um, and understanding that upfront is the most important thing. Right, like, like when we did TETF, we thought, man, this is an obvious trade. You know what? In hindsight, it's not, right? The entire ETF industry makes like, I they think I'd have to go look at my chart, but it's like the revenue for the entire ETF industry is under 20 billion, right? I think it's 13 or something right now. Okay, so who the freak investing in this $13 billion industry? Right. Right, like, like so like sometimes you got to listen to 
the world, right? And then we also learned with that one, everybody thought it was an ETF of all the ETFs, <laughs> right? Like, and then I had Eric Balchunas constantly telling me, oh, you should change the ticker to Meta. And gosh, I wish I would have listened to him. Yeah. <laughs> Ed Roundhill got that one and really killed it. Um, whatever they did, I don't know, but it, there's a good rumors. Uh, like, like, so there's so many things that we did wrong in the product, right? We fell in love with the investment concept. Like I still, I, like I said, I still run the index and the, the performance is spectacular relative to the S and P relative. It's uninvestable performance since I don't have the fund anymore, <laughs> but, uh, it's, our biggest mistakes was not understanding the market from product. Now, yeah. now let's say you get that part, right. Right. Like, that's the next thing. You, you get the product right. You get product market fit. You've got product market timing. Um, I put in there also usually some amount of seed, right? Because like you don't want to be talking to RIAs when you've got a hundred grand in an ETF. Because right. how much are they going to put in, right? Um, so if you get product right, the next thing is the biggest mistake I see with entrepreneurs in this is they get lost talking to each other and to their buddies and to the market makers and to this and that. And the only person they should be calling is RIAs. Right. <laughs> right? Like, like I've seen that lost energy. Like it's fine if you want to do Twitter spaces and some webinars and podcasts like these, these things are all building and credibility and, and all that, all the things that the NYSE offers or SIBO offers or whatever. Like there's so much free stuff that supports it. Take it all. But if you're not talking to four or five RIAs allocators a day, right. you're wasting your time. And I've right. seen it over and over again. They, they're calling people in there. Oh, my spread is too wide. Let me call Reggie. Reggie's not going to fix your spread. Right. <laughs> An RIA buying your ETF is going to fix right. your spread. <laughs> like, like, um, so, so yeah, I, those would be my two things. That's funny. Get the product right and then do the hard work. Dial yeah. for dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It, it 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 is true. I people have asked um you know, we we, we launched uh, our company in 2019. Mm -hmm. We had some success raising assets and they're like, "Well, how how'd you, you know, how'd you do it?" It's like, "Well, we just called RIAs and did demos for like 2 years." And like yeah. that's just what we did during COVID. I did a thousand demos on Zoom. Um yep. it's the hard stuff, you know, that uh you don't want to want to really do and it's funny you mentioned reggie i remember when we launched and we were like panicked and it's like why mm -hmm. is the spread blowing out why are we off a nav we'll call reggie that's it's just really yeah. funny i can relate to it um no it, it, it's it makes a lot of sense and look t actually that's a good one to get across to new people doing this call reggie or 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 call old miss or call murray or call hempstead when when you've got a trade coming yeah don't use your bullets up to, to make your spread look pretty when nobody's trading, like right. go get the trades and then call Reggie and say, I got a trade coming, please tighten up. Right. Like, like um, I've seen that wasted so many times. There's only so yeah. much will out there. Market making is a loss leading business. It's not like, it's not like, um, <laughs> it's not like that's how they make their money. They, they make their money in many different ways right. and I'm sure they do well, but that, that phone call is usually, a waste and it's amazing to me how people will will make five phone calls to a market maker and zero to an ria yeah call the ria like everybody looks at like the like guy ads on our platform with his atac funds yeah that guy I'm talking does to him in a couple weeks awesome he does yeah. nine to ten ria calls a day yeah right like yeah. he'll send me his calendar i'm like can we talk today he'll send me a picture of his calendar it's got nine ria calls back to back yeah right like it's everybody's there's not not a lot of respect for how much work has to be done to actually succeed. Yeah, that was one of the things I was going to talk to him about because he absolutely hammers email marketing, social. I'm sure he's doing. Every, I mean, he is. Yep. Th there's not a uh, there's not an hour that goes by that I don't see him, and you no. know that that takes a lot of work. <laughs> and so I'm in, I, an I'm, I am talking to him in a in a couple of weeks. I'm excited for that. Um, before we pivot to block, uh, and I want to talk about that for a little bit. Um, just how do you see the ETF landscape maybe changing? You're very deep in it. You you know the industry better than 99% of the people. How do you see this evolving over the next, you know, five, 10 years? Yeah. So look, 
it's very, very simple that it's just a better wrapper, right? Uh, Weisskopf, who's on my team, calls it structure matters. The ETF structure is just in terms of comparing it to LPs, SMAs, mutual funds, it's a better wrapper, right? You get yep. more tax efficiency and there's very little guarantees in the world of um, finance, but for a taxable investor, I can guarantee the exact same strategy in an ETF versus an SMA or a mutual fund. It's going to be better in an ETF. Yep. So, you know, we are going to see this wave of mutual fund conversions. Um, it's funny because I get, I hear all the time, well, that's going to be great for you and for Wes and for Garrett. I don't think that's going to be that huge for white labelers. Um, right. I, there's, you know, an indie mutual fund is not, you know, we'll get, we'll get those. I'll get them. We're doing one right now, but I don't think that's the big wave. The big wave is the giant mutual funds that need to convert. Yeah. And they're not going white label. So it doesn't yeah. matter. Um, what I've seen is the most amazing waves right now. Number one, active. Yeah. You had told me active would be what it is today. Three years ago, I'd be like, no, I don't see it. Um, even though I, I have one of the most successful active funds, this <laughs> early active fund. And when I did that, my partners were like, are you sure, Mike? And I'm like, that, that was back, we did block in 2018. And I was like, yes, this has to be active. Um, but the wave of active in ETFs is amazing to me. Yeah. And I think part of it is that products have gotten more complex. I think rule 18F4 has done more for the ETF industry than 6011, which was the ETF rule. 18F4 yeah. is the derivatives rule. Um, we've seen a massive hit on our platform with the yield max suite where um, the guys at Zega are, are generating yield off of single security. So long, long Tesla sell calls against it and get a yield. The yields have ranged anywhere from like 30 to 80%, depending on what the volatility of Tesla is that month. Um, so active is a big thing. Complicated is a big thing. Mutual fund conversions will be a big thing, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be a big, too big of a thing at the indie level. Most of the indie mutual funds either were successful and they're going to stay there or they weren't successful and have closed. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So those are probably the three big trends that I'm seeing the most right now in the ETF industry. Yeah. Well, that's great. So let's pivot to block. Yeah. Again, you said successful launch. Congratulations. Um, can you explain to me the strategy behind block? Yeah. So earlier in this conversation, we talked about TETF, right? So this was the ETF of the ETF industry. And, um, we we ran that I think as an ETF like 2013 uh, 14 to like 17 or 15 to 17. Sometime in early 2017, I'm at a market watch interview and at the Fox News building, and they're interviewing me about the whole industry. And the last question was, you know, what is the greatest threat to the ETF industry? And I said blockchain. Like someday all this stuff is gonna go from our traditional rails onto the blockchain. And they laughed at me. I mean, I mean they, there's like a video of it somewhere on the internet where they're like, they're like chuckling. Um, but that really was a nexus point for me, right? So we had just tried this ETF of the ETF industry. We realized the revenue was this small. Started researching blockchain, was starting to buy in our SMAs, you know, things in the blockchain space. Um, uh, because I saw it as a threat to ETFs. Right. Like just like when I was at Horizon Kinetics, we saw ETFs as a threat to concentrated SMAs and hedge funds. Yep. I saw blockchain as a threat to ETFs. So I said, let me get ahead of this. And it was just really lucky timing. Um, we had the ticker. Um, we actually had BLOC and BLOQ and Phil Bach had BLOK. And Phil was building his trading sub advisory business. That's how we actually got to work with him. And at the exact same time, Amplify was going down the path of doing a passive version of a blockchain fund with uh, an index from uh, EQM and this gentleman, Gabriel Rojo. We all just kind of came together, kismet, right, at the same time and said, yep. there needs to be a blockchain fund, but we decided it couldn't be passive at the time, which was a huge difference 
in 2018. Like now everything's active. Like 90% of the things that get pitched to me are active. So the reason we said it had to be active was at that time, companies were just changing their name to XYZ blockchain, right? And how can an index deal with that? Um, it's ironic because that same argument is why, you know, the one we just did with Roundhill chat, they went active for the same reasons because they're worried that companies are just going to, um, AI, in the name. AI wash, right? So yep. you had block block wash. Now you got AI wash. You've had you've had dot com wash, right? Uh, Burton Malkiel wrote about this in Random Walk fifty years ago, right? So so uh, that's the that's that's a really interesting thing in the ETF world is the new form of active. It's not always about you know overweighting and underweighting or tilting or some sort of factor. Sometimes it's actively trying to achieve a theme in an inefficient market, right? Um, so block is pretty simple. Even though we weren't able to say the word blockchain in the name back then, the SEC literally called us the day before launch and told us to change the name, but we had the ticker and that made it so people understood what we were doing. And uh, now there's, I think, 19 funds that do this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and block is larger than the other 18 combined, which is amazing when you include like Fidelity and Schwab and BlackRock and First Trust and stuff. Um, I think the reason is Block is an actual active fund where we actually meet with the management and know what's going on, and and it's a diversified fund. So it falls under the rules of diversification. So we're never 80% in the miners or like I see some of the passive ones. I've seen them where they're at you know, 18% in a single security that could yeah. be Coinbase or you know, we never have more. We stop adding to a position when it hits 5%. Um, so block is a strategy where we're trying to you know participate in this change over to blockchain now we talked about TETF the ETF industry you know 13 14 billion crypto miners made like 30 to 40 billion yeah. then you have like boring blockchain you know the IBM using this or that or or Maresk using supply chain that's like another 30 40 billion so there's that product market fit right like it's got the revenue where people care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right, well, uh, I, so. I think I understand like the security selection piece. How are you, since it's active, are you, how are you waiting inside the index? Yeah. You know, those, those picks. So um, we set it up very much like thinking like an indexer, right? So um, a core position, one that is, you know, got true revenue from the blockchain space and has the liquidity and the maturity that's going to get weighted at 3% and allowed to float up to five. And a non-core is going to get weighted at 1% and allowed to float up to three. Um, now, the second level is that we've got eight segments. We used to have seven. We just added one about nine months ago. So there's no like Gix thing for Bitcoin miners, right? <laughs> so so we had to create our own segments, right? Um, and, and so we have things like uh, crypto miners. We have... Um, uh, conglomerates. We have a semiconductor bucket, you know, and figuring out which semi companies are actually making chips that are used in this space is not easy. But that's, again, why we talk to management. What we learn mm -hmm. talking to managements is more about the supply chain and the other companies than we do about those companies themselves. Yeah. Um, we have exposure to crypto itself. So we own some of the Canadian spot Bitcoin ETFs in block and we have not only do we own micro strategies, we also own as bonds. That's another okay. thing Block can do that no one else has done. We own That's bonds, <laughs> so um, you know we have, we bought micro strategy bonds the last time crypto collapsed, and it was just like, okay, this is better in the cap structure. We're going to participate, and you know, so um, yeah. So the the weighting system is is based on core and non core, and not allowing any segment to become more than twenty five percent of the overall portfolio. Yeah, that's interesting. And so as far as adoption of that product, um, do you, I would, I'm making an assumption here. I, I would assume you have a good bit of retail in that product, but the way that it's put together, I'm sure that there's some institutional adoption of that as well. And RA yeah, adoption. so we've been through the due diligence at Morgan Stanley and, and I think Wells Fargo. So like, look, we talk here a lot about the indie and the and and how hard it is. Block is actually on the other side now, right? Because it was early and it was done 
in a way with the institutional mindset. Now it actually has a moat against a lot of the indie, like it's going to be very hard for even BlackRock to get their version of a blockchain ETF approved at, at Morgan Stanley, right? <laughs> um, yep. It doesn't have the assets, doesn't have the liquidity. So it's, it's crossed that chasm and now is benefiting from some of the, the unfairness in the early parts of the ETF industry. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm sure we have retail in there, but mostly who I talk to about it are large RIAs and family offices and, and Morgan and Wells Fargo kind of advisors. Yeah. Um, yeah that makes a lot of sense, but look, Mike, this was, uh, this was great. And, um, I learned some, I learned some things today. I'm sure some people will, will learn some things as well. And look, I really appreciate your time and I hope, uh, I get the opportunity to run into you at some time uh, in the future yeah. at, at an industry event and, and say hello. But again, I really appreciate your time and enjoy yourself in LA for the short time that you're, that yeah. you're there. Well, look, good for you, man. I really appreciate you having me. I mean, but I, I appreciate that you're out there doing this every day. And that's what, I mean, to me, that's probably the biggest lesson from all the things we talked about today. This is a grind. And if you're not doing what Brad's doing or Gaiad's doing or Bob Elliott's doing, you're then just going to be complaining that it's not working. <laughs> uh, you're the one not working. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you got to grind right. it out. <laughs> well, Mike, thank you very much. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.